May I first say that I am truly honored and humbled to be a speaker in such a diverse and large, talented group of speakers today, so thank you very much. I'm going to give a talk today because I like telling stories, and the stories, all good stories have villains, they have a moral, and hopefully they wind up with redemption at the end. Or, although remember, I'm a scientist, a winning scientist, and the provost at a science-based university as I give this talk because I am going to speak profoundly in favor of liberal arts and science education. Now, let's introduce you to the bad guys. First, the first bad guy is a real bad guy and I can't actually tell you I'm going to be able to fix this bad guy. That's economic instability and unemployment, okay? The second bad guy though, and this bad guy is going to keep coming up again and again, is Godzilla there. And this is what we are trying to do as a society to fix the first bad guy. These are the assumptions we're making about the values of education and what we should do to quote unquote fix education so that it will actually fix unemployment and global instability. So how bad is bad? Well, if each one of those quarters is 25 million people, right now, our best guess is there are 75 million people, 15 to 24 years of age, who do not have jobs. If we look at people who are underemployed in this group, that comes out to 225 million people in the world. That is more than three times the rate of unemployment or underemployment of those people's parents. So this is a significant and real bad problem. But the problem has a second part, like all problems. And this is the part that makes people crazy. Because if the quarters were the people who wanted jobs, the piggy banks are employers who want employees. And what the people are telling us who employ people is that 43% of employers can't find the employees they want because the people simply do not have the skills to meet those jobs. And that piggy bank is almost, those 43 piggy banks there, are almost enough to take all of those quarters of those people who are underemployed or unemployed. It's almost big enough. So here comes the solution. It's a four letter word, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math education, right? I want to remind you one more time that I'm a scientist and I'm in the field of science education, but I want you to alert you to this guy in the corner, Godzilla. Uh-huh. Whenever you see him, go, wait a second, he's the bad guy. What is he doing on a page with the good guys? Well, what we really need to know is what is the purpose of education? Because increasingly what I hear is that it's to get jobs. Dun, 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 Godzilla, right? So the reason you guys are in school right now is to get a job, really. The reason you're gonna to go to university or college is really to get a job, really? Let's take a look at that. Why on earth would we take STEM over everything else one could possibly do in college or university high school? Well, because there are a large number of very high profile reports out there that say that from 2013 to 2023, and if you graduate, say the end of June this year, and you go through university and you do it on time and as fast as you can, you're gonna graduate right in the middle of that period. Your jobs are gonna be in trades, and if they're in university based, it's going to be engineering, telecommunications, biotech, and aerospace. That's where the jobs are, period. All of those seem very STEM, don't they? When we look at the eight most popular uh, post-secondary degrees, I've highlighted for you the STEM ones. And the size of the circle is related to how many people are getting those degrees. The two smallest circles on this board are the STEM ones. So yes, we are in trouble with STEM education. Lots of people are not doing it. And in fact, every week, 
we hear about some poor soul who went to university, racked up massive debt, took something non-STEM, let's say history, and now the only thing they are qualified to do is serve coffee at a coffee shop, right? This is a fallacy, and I'm going to take you through this piece now, because this is not true. This is a myth. Because if this was true, if jobs required more specialization within STEM, what we increasingly hear is that we should remove useless courses and focus more on career-ready degrees. And what we'll be able to do is by focusing on biotech and aerospace, those kinds of things, we'll be able to ensure that everybody in this room has a job. Oh, Godzilla. What really is going on here is somewhat of an attack on the ivory tower or the university. Because what is inherent in that coffee shop analogy is a suggestion that universities are old and arcane. They don't provide you with the things you need to be successful in the real world. Or the way I like to think of it, Godzilla attacking the university. So what are the basics of a STEM education then? Well, obviously science, things like physics, clearly. Technology, that seems self-evident. Engineering, check. Math, sure, why not? Now we've got STEM. Languages, languages. Why language? Like English? Well, okay, yeah, I can get this because surely you're able to, to be able to communicate with other people. You should be able to, you know, communicate effectively, synthesize information. Sure, okay, I'll buy English. What about the social sciences? Things like, say, geography. Geography, well, anybody can read a map. I mean, holy Toledo. Okay, wait a second, wait a second. The GPS in my car, that's kind of geography. It's kind of STEMI. Okay, yeah, we can include things like the social sciences. Yep, absolutely. Okay, I can buy that. What about the humanities? And I'm picking on history, but I could pick on any of them because these are the arguments you'll hear. What about history? Why do I, as a neuroscientist, need to understand the Italian Renaissance? What could I possibly learn about the Italian Renaissance that could inform what I need to know today to use my microscope? Well, I'd like to tell you an awful lot. And what I hear repeatedly when we talk about STEM education is that we pretty much should get rid of everything under the math and have more of everything above that piece. Because people can just watch the History Channel. People can use their GPS. And everybody speaks English anyway, right? So Godzilla is even bigger in those set of assumptions. And why is that? Well, because it's on what is the nature of a useless course. I did not set out in my career to become an academic administrator. I, I, it's not what I got a PhD for. I got a PhD because it was better than getting a real job and I was really curious about the question, right? But it really depends on the job, what the useless course is. Because I really actually don't use very much math anymore. I've never taken engineering and I'm a huge technophile. I love technology, right? But I've never taken a course in it. So what is the useless job course, or what is the useless course? Well, it really depends on where the jobs are going to be. And because I'm a university academic, I need to tell you this. From 2011 to 2020, the government of Canada predicts, they track a large number of professions, and they say that for university professions that they track, there are going to be 11 of them that are going to be in shortage. There are going to be not enough people getting those jobs. One of them is going to be in surplus. The one to really watch, because you all are in high school right now, is this number right here. For high school qualifications, for those of you who are planning on dropping out tomorrow, there are going to be 24 jobs they track that will be in surplus. There will be more of you than there are actual jobs. 
So the best thing you can do to get out of this column is to go to either college or university. There are really, really actual jobs out there for you in the future. Now, I'm not going to read the list to you, but I did highlight the STEM professions since STEM is going to solve everything. So in red are the jobs that rely entirely on STEM disciplines that are going to be in surplus in the future. An awful lot of black on that page. And on top of all, I should probably, this is the nasty piece, is by 2020, we're going to have too many computer and information systems analysts. Okay, so there's going to be actually a surplus in a STEM field. So why is so much focus on STEM? Well, in some sense, we can all agree that there are great drivers of global change. We've heard a number of stories about this already, right? And a large number of these rely on STEM, right? We've all seen the Futurama thing where the spaceship drops the ice cube into the ocean and stops global warming, right? Science saved us. Well, you know, there is a huge STEM component to all of these drivers of global change. And these solutions require more literacy than ever before. You're required to synthesize more information faster from a wider variety of sources than you've ever had to. It's also going to require a greater knowledge of STEM disciplines and greater numbers of people to work in those fields. So why is there a disconnect between STEM and everything else? I argue it's a matter of culture. To some extent, the humanities are an easy target, right? STEM cures diseases, STEM makes rockets, does brain surgery. But I come back to my original question, what is the purpose of a university education? In 1959, C.P. Snow gave a read lecture called Two Cultures. In it, he, called, he said, there are two groups of academics, each equally educated, equally smart, and they are functionally illiterate about what each other do. He argued that most literary theorists do not know the second law of thermodynamics. And for those of you who are nodding at my table, you're the physicists. And that is just as a primer, that's the second law of thermodynamics. But how about let's flip it the other way. A quote from Montague, and I like this quote in part because it says, science isn't just a collection of facts, it's a culture. Science is a culture just like anything else. The doctor has been taught to be interested not in health, but the disease. We conceptualize that as um, science. So here's the redemption. So I promised you redemption. Mothra attacking Godzilla. If I were to ask you right now who you thought was a genius, two common examples are Einstein or Shakespeare. And I can tell you right now what you're interested in based on what you say. If you are interested in the arts and in literature, you are more likely to say it's Shakespeare. If you are interested in STEM disciplines, you are more likely to say it's Einstein. We use what we value to judge genius. So I come back to the pressures of today's society. We're all going to need greater skill sets. We all are going to have to do more technically difficult work. And we're going to face periods of great instability. Classic university training, to my mind, is the answer to this. Regardless of the discipline you're studying, be it biology or history, everyone should have a knowledge of the humanities, science, social sciences, languages, math or logic, and often a fine arts component wouldn't kill us. Right? It's a truly arts and science perspective here that I am teaching and trying to get at. To solve the great problems, we need a greater interchange between science and the humanities, humanities and science. Science without the humanities is progress without ethics. Humanities without science is ethics without data, right? They actually really need to talk to each other and influence each other. And indeed, that's what Snow was trying to say in 1959. When one works together, it is both progressive and ethical. UNESCO says the purpose of education is thusfold. Learning to know, that's your formal education. Learning to do, skills. Learning to live together, that's leadership, right? And learning to be, personal growth. This is a lifelong approach to education, not just what you're done when you're done at the end of June. 
The purpose of education, to my mind, is citizenship. It is building leaders. It is absolutely making doctors and lawyers and engineers and scientists and historians. But the biggest piece you can't get anywhere else is actually truly trying out a whole bunch of things that you wouldn't be able to do anywhere else. So I'll end my talk with a note. Over the past 17 years, I have been extraordinarily privileged to have large interactions with people about your age. I teach introductory psychology, right? And they come to me and they go, how am I going to get a job? What am I going to do? And I tell them exactly what I did myself. And it echoes what we've heard as well. Follow your passion. Do what you love and be good at it. And if that is making coffee, make the best coffee you can make. Because let me tell you, I think we've all heard of a little chain called Starbucks, right? The money is going to follow, right? Do not worry about the job. Follow your passion and be good at it. This is the only time in your life where you have the freedom to explore whatever you want and you should do it. Do not worry about becoming a physician so that you can get a job or becoming a teacher because you want the summers off. Be a teacher because you love children and you love inspiring people, right? Do that. Don't do something for any other reason. I'll end with my favorite quote. It's on my email always. And that is from Conan O'Brien from his last show. Nobody in life gets exactly what they thought they were going to get. But if you work really hard and you're kind, amazing things will happen. Thank you.